Hi, welcome to this third lecture on Thomas Kuhn's famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Um, this will be on section two or chapter two, they're technically called sections in Kuhn, which is entitled The Route to Normal Science. And if you've been following me in this series so far, you'll see that in the first two episodes, I talked about the importance of Thomas Kuhn's work, um, its influence, its historical context, and we saw the central role that history plays in the work. In this episode, I'm going to focus on the idea of a paradigm. We'll see that this idea will be um, developed throughout the entire course of the essay. Indeed, it's quite fair to say that one purpose of Thomas Kuhn's book is to introduce and develop the idea of a paradigm as um, the central concept for studying the history of the evolution of science and scientific theory and practice. And the concept of a paradigm has been the most influential aspect of Thomas Kuhn's book. So I want to start by um, giving you a sense of Kuhn's idea of a paradigm from the beginning of the chapter. And then what I'm going to do is take what will seem like a fairly long digression of about maybe seven to ten minutes in which I'll talk about the way in which we use the concept of a paradigm today. And I'll discuss the way in which I think it's encouraged a type of um, very useful extension of Kuhn's idea, but also a type of pseudoscientific extension of Kuhn's idea. <clears throat> I'm going to argue actually that the concept of a paradigm is quite useful for um, distinguishing a type of pseudoscience that I think is quite common in contemporary academia. So this will be about the idea of a paradigm. It'll be about the um, Kuhn's idea of a paradigm, a digression about how paradigm is used more broadly, and then from that digression, which will really be the central part of the lecture, I'll then discuss in the concluding part um, why paradigms are so important and how we might think about them, both in a way that lets us continue to learn from Kuhn's book and to deal with the sort of, as I'm going to have argued, pseudoscientific extension of the concept. So let me begin by giving you a sense of what Kuhn means. In, in the very beginning of section two, The Route to Normal Science, he says, quote, Normal science means research firmly based upon one or more past scientific achievements, achievements that some particular scientific community acknowledges for a time, as supplying the foundation for its further practice. And today, such achievements are recounted, though seldom in their original form, by science textbooks, elementary and, adv and advanced. Now, let me begin by picking up on this point from my last lecture about textbook science. It's a feature of a successful paradigm that it can issue and must issue in textbooks. Why? Because a textbook is able to summarize both at the introductory or elementary and the advanced level, a textbook is able to summarize the existing paradigm such that um, an advanced practitioner, a working scientist, does not have to um, start with the assumptions and the problems that the textbook lays out. But having understood them, they can work on the cutting edge problems of the paradigm itself. In other words, a textbook shows that a science has matured enough to have a highly specialized character. And the ability to specialize assumes a common body of assumptions, theoretical and practical, that allow cooperative work. And Kuhn begins by saying the common assumptions of a scientific paradigm are that it's built on past achievements um, which is firmly based on past achievements that some community acknowledges as supplying the foundation for its further practice. Now, we'll see that in this chapter, Kuhn's main example of a, a kind of paradigmatic case of a paradigm is the history of physical optics, which I'll talk just a little bit about. But of course, you can just read the read the chapter for yourself if you're interested in the details. Um, he goes on to say that Many of the classic works in science, like Lyell's Geology or Franklin's Electricity, or Lavoisier's Chemistry, that they functioned um, for a time implicitly to define the legitimate problems and methods of a research field for succeeding generations of practitioners. 
In other words, they functioned like a textbook today. They were able to do so, Kuhn goes on, because they shared two essential characteristics. So this is very important. These are the two foundational characteristics of a paradigm, according to Thomas Kuhn. First, their achievement was sufficiently unprecedented to attract an enduring group of adherents away from competing modes of scientific activity. So that's the first one. So it was sufficiently unprecedented to draw people away from prior modes of science towards this new articulation. Simultaneously, Kuhn says, it was sufficiently open-ended to leave all sorts of problems for the redefined group of practitioners to resolve. Now, this is an extremely interesting uh, feature, and I think ultimately a kind of fascinatingly problematic feature of paradigms, but it's essential to recognize it. So the first is that the achievement was sufficiently unprecedented to gather a new community away who had been interested in previous theories to this theory. And then secondly, it was sufficiently open-ended to give them something to do and actually to give them lots of very interesting things to do and to study. So he says, achievements that share these two characteristics I shall henceforth refer to as paradigms, a term that relates closely to normal science. So in other words, we saw in the opening quote of this essay of the section that normal science is what Kuhn begins to define and by the end of the first paragraph, we realize that normal science um, is, in fact, closely related to the concept of a paradigm. So we can say now that a paradigm is what enables normal science to happen in Kuhn's term. So it's important to remember, if you're encountering Kuhn for the first time, that the phrase normal science is a technical term. So it's not, it doesn't mean like science as you might just use it in some general sense as it's normally done. Kuhn means by normal science, paradigmatic science, science based on a paradigm. And this is a very significant claim because Kuhn is basically going to argue that we don't really see the emergence of um, scientific paradigms in many areas of science until the 17th century. The exceptions, of course, he mentions are mathematics and astronomy, which, as he said, were established in prehistory and received major um, development and articulation in the ancient Greek world. <clears throat> this is ultimately, incidentally, to do with Plato's Academy. Um, well, that was my mic part in that. So this is the idea of a paradigm. And he says, by choosing the word, I mean to suggest that some accepted examples of actual scientific practice, examples which include law, theory, application, and instrumentation together. That's very important. Law, theory, application and instrumentation together provide models from which spring particular coherent traditions of scientific research. So you could say, Sam, what's a what's an example of a scientific paradigm today? He's going to give the examples I said of physical optics, but let me give you the most obvious example working backwards from what he says, which is from the exact sciences, particularly in this case of um, physics or what we will often call particle physics or fundamental physics sometimes. And in this case, right, you've all maybe heard of the of CERN, which is a um, a European research institution that has the most advanced particle collider in the world, and that is the which is the large um, hadron collider, I believe, today, and that is the an example of instrumentation. So CERN is a multi, multi, multi billion dollar institution and research center whose collider um, is an extraordinarily expensive, I mean, tens of billions of dollars, I believe, uh, ultimately went into the most recent one, maybe 10 billion, but it might have been more than that. And that's an example of an extreme example of instrumentation beyond what Kuhn himself in his own time in the 1960s would have had as an example. So the entire idea of a particle collider is based on an extremely rigorously worked out paradigm. So what they're doing in particle colliders is testing scientific a scientific paradigm, basically what we would today call the, the standard model, um, in which particles and the capacity based on the standard model to smash particles together at very high speeds have extremely specific expectations so that scientists are looking for certain outcomes when they're using these very expensive instruments that they have at CERN. 
So the instrumentation is itself an application of the standard model. The ability to use this very advanced instrument is an application, right? Lasers are an application of the paradigm of, of modern sort of physics in the broad sense, the paradigm that ultimately come from the development of the modern theory of light, quantum theory, and the development of the laser, which I think is in the late 40s or early 50s, is an example of an application of science. And lasers are, of course, involved, for example, in the instrumentation of something like, you know, the, the particle collider. And so the particle collider at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, is an example of an instrument and uh, really a complex and enormously complex series of instruments. But if you think of the whole thing as a gigantic kind of instrument, and that instrument is itself a form of an application of the standard model, which is a theory. And the standard model is a theory that's developing and trying to further understand certain laws. And those laws, in the case of physics, are mathematical laws. They're laws that describe with incredible exactitude um, something. And what those mathematical laws describe is partly what the theory is giving you a sense of. And then the theory is giving you ways to test what those mathematical laws actually mean in our attempt to understand them. So this is unique to physics, but it's why physics is a really good paradigm kind of example. So that is an example today of um, a, a paradigm and a paradigm-based science. Is there, there are people, for example, who say you don't need these really expensive colliders that cost billions of dollars. You can test even aspects of the standard model without them, which I suppose is, is true, but obviously it's worthwhile to the scientific community as a whole. Uh, to test these things. But if people don't agree with the p theory, if they don't agree with the paradigm that governs what's happening, for example, at CERN, they'll be quite critical of the use of money that's spent on these um, colliders because they think the money should be going to develop instrumentation or testing abilities or applications of alternate theories, which if those theories became successful, would become paradigms. But it's very important to understand that um, there are multiple theories always at any given point in the scientific community, but there are not multiple paradigms. So the concept of a paradigm emerging has to do with a sufficient amount of consensus um, for in Kuhn's view. Um, and so this is, I think, quite important. And some people might contest what I just said. And I think for some good reasons, because the concept of a paradigm ends up being one of the most ambiguous, not in a negative way, but it's a very broad concept, but it also has very specific meanings. But I think in the core way Kuhn introduces it, you could say that the concept of a paradigm is a, a an achievement, a singular achievement, which has as its essence, as part of its essence, this idea of consensus about past achievements in science, which enable extremely specialized testing developments of the paradigm. So that's the idea of a paradigm in a very brief nutshell. Um, and it, the extent to which the paradigm is real is hard to convey, right? In physics, it'd be hard to convey to me because I'm not a physicist. But in science in general, it's hard to convey because of how specialized it is. So if you've never done any academic research at an advanced level, if you haven't c contributed to academic research, it's very difficult to understand how specific um, scientific uh, paradigm-based research is. So what we're really talking about with a paradigm is a community that has a sense of what the world is like and is able to develop a tradition based on an understanding of a theory that they think is getting at the world, and that by articulating and developing that theory, the people in the paradigm believe that they're practicing the best form of science that they can practice. And the paradigm enables people to together work on highly specific problems. And that work on highly specific problems is the vast majority of scientific work. Hence, Kuhn's, I think, quite apt term, normal science. So normal science and paradigmatic science are broadly speaking synonyms, broadly speaking. You could think of normal science more specifically as a concept that a paradigm enables. So a paradigm is the kind of mother concept and a normal science is the sort of child 
that the paradigm produces. And so where you have normal science, you have a paradigm in Kuhn's sense. This is quite important. Um, and it's also the case that in Kuhn's view, normal science is what enables the emergence of scientific revolutions. So in other words, a paradigm we now see is not only connected and in this sense synonymous with normal science by enabling the idea of a large body of people sharing the same assumptions and working out the implications of those assumptions together. It's also the case that normal science is the condition for revolutionary science. So Kuhn's concept of the development of science through scientific revolutions specifically has to do with the development of paradigmatic science. And once you have paradigmatic science um, or scientific paradigms in different communities, then you have the idea that gives you the basis for revolutionary development, radical changes, in, as we'll see in worldview. So and when I said a concept of a paradigm is singular, I don't mean there's not multiple paradigms, but there's multiple paradigms across different sciences. Um, but if in physics today, it, the paradigm in physics today is the standard model. That's the paradigm. If in 50 years, um, the standard model is no longer the accepted theory, then by definition, there will have been a scientific revolution in physics. And so, for example, many people think that you know, if someone comes up with a more or less undisputed um, solution to the problem of quantum gravity, if they can combine quantum theory with Einstein's general theory of relativity successfully, not just, you know, which again, string theorists, for example, believe they're doing and other people working on it think they're doing, but if they do so so successfully that basically everyone, broadly speaking, will shift to their theory then we will have witnessed a scientific revolution and it will be difficult for people 50 years from now to intuitively understand the standard model. So that's a kind of strange implication, but that Kuhn enables us to think about the way in which future revolutions can make current science unintelligible. And it's very, very strange, isn't it? It's strange to think that something that everyone takes for granted now could become unintelligible. It's so strange that it can seem like, how could that possibly be scientific progress? And as we'll see, that's again, one of the core facts that Kuhn's trying to understand because he recognizes, yeah, but this is, this is how science works. So let me now point out what I think is the uh, central aspect of the paradigm, which is that it enables highly advanced and productive scientific specialization. So this is extremely important, highly advanced and productive specialization. So he's, and this, this is why it's so difficult to understand science. And um, people often complain about this, but Kuhn is right that this capacity of a paradigm to create really specialized science is extremely important. And it's also very important as we'll see for the ability for us to take for granted what counts as a scientific fact. Because one of the really fascinating aspects of Kuhn, which he did not invent, but that this, this book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, popularized, is the idea that facts, at least in science, are in a complicated sense constructed. doesn't mean they're not real, but a fact is not a simple object when you're talking about paradigms. And I'll give you uh, maybe an example of that today, but I'm definitely going to develop that idea in the subsequent episodes. So let me point out this issue of specialization. And from the issue of specialization, I'll then make my little digression about the way the concept of a paradigm has been extended. And I'll use the example of my own broad field of philosophy, and I'll show how you get extensions of the idea that I think are invalid from Kuhn's standpoint, and therefore actually a kind of unintentional example of pseudoscientific theory. So he says, Although it has become customary and is surely proper to deplore the widening gulf that separates the professional scientist from his colleagues in other fields, too little attention is paid to the essential relationship between that gulf and the mechanisms intrinsic to scientific advance. In other words, even though people rightly complain, and my entire life is addressing this problem, so I in insofar as I have expertise, for example, one of my areas of expertise is on the concept of specialization. 
and its implications for knowledge. Um, and in fact, that's the, the essence of what connects my applied or practical work in institutions. The Marginalia Review of Books is an institution which is a magazine in one sense, but it also embodies a research initiative. And I have a white paper I'll eventually publish, about 10,000 words, about the Marginalia Review of Books sort of theoretical foundations, which is based on the problem of scientific specialization and the need to integrate knowledge. And it was a proposal connected to that matter that was what secured the funding for the Marginalia's Meanings of Science project. And the Meanings of Science project self-consciously is addressing this problem. So, for example, the original group of contributors to the project, when I wrote them, um, their invitation letters, this was part of what I explained to each of them was why I was interested in them contributing and why what we're doing is different than, um, say, just another project to popularize science. I'm not so much interested in popularizing science as making science intelligible to itself. And here again, by science, I mean in the very broad sense, the German sense Wissenschaft knowledge, rigorous um, knowledge that you might even say is professional professionally produced in some sense. So Kuhn's point is people deplore the fact that science has become so specialized that scientists can't even understand each other. And that is a big problem. That's one of the problems that, again, I'm working to address in my life and work. But he also says not enough attention is paid to the fact that this is essential uh, to the mechanisms by which we have scientific advance. So let me explain this um, in a little bit of detail. I'll then this will lead me to my digression about pseudoscience and then to the conclusion. So what is specialization? You know, we take this for granted, but we really shouldn't. It's a very important concept, and uh, I could give a whole course on it. Uh, indeed, I could do a whole master's program. I think we ought to have something like that on the concept of um, specialization because it's an interdisciplinary concept. And the major contributions to it particularly come from sociology. But Kuhn's book is one of the major contributions to, I think, the concept of specialization. That's part of my interest in Kuhn, is I have multiple angles of interest in Kuhn's work, partly as a historian and philosopher of Wissenschaft or science, but also as a, as a philosopher and practitioner of specialized research who seeks to mitigate the negative effects of specialization. So what is specialization? Specialization is best understood um, as a, a highly um, specified form of the division of labor. What is the division of labor? The most famous example of the division of labor um, in the modern world comes from the example of a pin factory um, that's a fruit of the scientific revolution in England that was described in The Wealth of Nations by the great political uh, philosopher, political economist, economist Adam Smith. And Adam Smith basically gives the example of the fact that you can, you can have a single craftsperson who's responsible for every aspect of making a pin. And this person will have to do all kinds of things. They'll have to procure materials. They'll have to shape the materials. They'll have to then manually, with a high degree of specialized um, skill and dexterity, do whatever the proper operations are to take the materials and shape them into the parts that then need to be combined to become a pin. So that's a complex process with a single output. Okay, it's very important. A complex process with a single output, the output is a pin, right? Just like if you think about it, this is a this mouse that I have on my keyboard is a single product, and it was made through an extremely complex process, a process far more complex than the product, the process that probably made a pin in Adam Smith's example. But what this mouse that I have has in common with Adam Smith's pin is it was produced from a division of labor, which is Smith gives the example of um, a pin factory, which by separating each part of the process of making a pin into a small unit, say one person procures the material for each part of the pin. Say there's three different materials to simplify it. And instead of one person having to each get each of the three different materials, then shape them, make them the right kind of shape to turn them into the parts, there's one person responsible for the parts of the pin. And then there's another person responsible for the manufacturing of those parts into the relevant complex unit. And then there's a third person responsible for turning those parts into the final product of a pin. Now that's simplifying it again. You can read 
um, Smith's example if you want. It's just a couple pages. If you Google Adam Smith pin, you'll come up with this right away. So that's an example of the division of labor. And the division of labor is not thought enough about. And if you don't think enough about it, then it's hard to think about specialization well. So this is not an, an adequate introduction to the concept of the division of labor. Um, but if you want to know the two fields of modern academia that develop the concept of the division of labor most systematically are the field of economics, as we see in the example of Smith from the Wealth of Nations, and the field of sociology. And the, the fact that those two fields don't really talk to each other is not a great, not a great thing from a scientific standpoint, but th those are the two fields you would want to look at. I would say much more ultimately sociology because the greatest work on the division of labor ever written was a book by Emil Durkheim called The Division of Labor. And this is an enormously difficult book. Um, people, most people I don't think can read and understand this book who are professional. Um, I shouldn't say this, but I don't, I don't think today that most people who are even sociologists have carefully read that book and, and understand it deeply enough so that they could teach it really effectively because it's very, very difficult. Um, it's, it's one of the truly great works, I think, in the history of science, and it is a contribution to science. If you don't think that there is a form of genuinely scientific sociology, I would suggest you need to read Durkheim. Um, so that's the division of labor. And you can say, now I've introduced specialization. The division of labor is you specialize um, a single process that's complex. You break it into parts, and then you have people do only one of those processes focused on one of those parts of the complex process. And that involves, you could say, the minimum form of specialization. Now, as a matter of history, the actual first systematic <laughs> description of the importance of the division of labor that I know of is in Plato, in Plato's Republic, actually, in book, uh, I think, two. But it might be book one, but I think it's book two, after the first discussion of justice in book one. So we don't need to talk about that now. So specialization is a highly advanced form <clears throat> of the division of labor when it's legitimate, when it's legitimate. Often specialization is not legitimate. Um, and I think the modern academy is full of pseudoscience um, for reasons that Kuhn actually helps us understand precisely because you have the apparatus of the division of labor, but you don't actually have the key distinctives of the division of labor. You don't have a single product, which in the scientific case would be knowledge or shared understandings <clears throat> that everyone can use, but you have the apparatus of specialization. So basically, specialization is taking a complex deep thing and break it into parts so that you can better understand it. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, in an intellectual context, specialization, of course, isn't producing a pin. The product of specialization is supposed to be knowledge. But it's very important to understand the concept of specialization entails the concept of a part relative to a whole. If you have 10 people working as specialists in a subject area, but none of their work connects, then they're not, no matter how specialized they are, what they're doing isn't real work or it's not being used properly. So for example, think of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the most successful, secret, scientific project in all of history. Probably the most successful, um, large scale to that point project in the history of humanity in the sense of pooling the most enormously difficult specialist problems, in this case related to nuclear physics, atomic energy, taking all of the people requisite to understand those problems and using them to solve a series of scientific problems that had a single output, which was the atomic bomb. So that's a good example of genuine specialization because the specialization had a single output, which was the discovery of how to successfully at a theoretical level and then at a practical level, how to successfully create the processes that would result in the atomic bomb, which the Manhattan Project successfully did, right? And, and as a result, it changed history and changed the world. It made it possible to destroy the world right away. In fact, it's an incredibly dramatic story, which I think, I haven't seen the new Oppenheimer movie, but I understand they actually depict this scene. But I read about it in um, 
a book on the history of DARPA, an excellent book. I can't remember the author's name. But uh, they they didn't know when they were first testing the atomic bomb, they didn't know whether or not they wouldn't destroy the entire world That because it was possible that they could light the actual atmosphere on fire. And if they had done that, they would have destroyed the entire uh, Earth by destroying the atmosphere. So that was a world-changing event, and that was the result of extremely advanced scientific specialization in exactly the kind of paradigmatic science sense that Kuhn is talking about. Okay, now in the last 10 minutes, let me give you the digression about pseudoscience and its implications. So Kuhn in this chapter, you'll see, is quite aware of the fact that um, very recently, the idea of specialization acquired a kind of prestige in its own right, which is very strange. He says, in the sciences, the formation of specialized journals, the foundation of specialist societies, and the claim for a special place in the curriculum have usually been associated with the group's first reception of a single paradigm. At least this was the case between the time, a century and a half ago, when the institutional pattern of scientific specialization first developed, this is key, listen to this, and the very recent time when the paraphernalia of specialization acquired a prestige of its own. The very recent time, 1962, he's writing, when the paraphernalia of specialization acquired a prestige of its own, meaning, for example, specialized journals, societies, and etc. So he says the more rigid definition of the scientific group has other consequences. And the consequences include the fact that if you don't have a paradigm, everything that could be part of your science would seem potentially relevant. In other words, you don't really know how to select which facts and say these facts are the really important facts. These phenomenon, these phenomena are the really important phenomena. And so you have a lot of different people who, in order to do any work, can't be very specialized because you have to articulate first principles, you have to articulate concepts, and then you have to sort of work through a large morass, a huge amount of facts, and try to select facts that are relevant. When you have a paradigm, it tells you what facts are significant. In fact, as Kuhn says in this chapter, it tells you what facts are particularly revealing about the character of the world, right? So this is extremely important. For example, prior to Einstein, if you had said it was a fact that light bends, this would have been regarded as as ridiculous. Um, it, not only ridiculous, but it would have been regarded as unintelligible, as inconceivable and pseudo pseudoscientific. Um, but because of Einstein's work, first in the special theory of relativity, and then in the general theory of relativity, we, we know now for a fact, this is part of the universally accepted paradigm, in physics, we know that uh, light bends. And this is sort of, you could say, this has to do with the combination of the general theory of relativity about gravity with Einstein and the quantum theory of light. So the theory of light that developed, and then the theory of gravity that developed in the first two decades of the 20th century led us to understand, no, actually, because of the way that gravity works and because of the way that photons work, light um, bends, and it bends because of the uh, effects of gravity. Um, at least this is, the, this is the basic understanding as I have it. So this fact is a, is a theoretical fact. The fact that light bends is not a simple idea. It is an immensely complicated idea, so complicated that Einstein needed to find or develop, which he found um, in Riemannian geometry, uh, he needed an, a new form of non-Euclidean geometry. He needed a new way of mathematically thinking about space in order to describe what he was discovering. So this, is, this also then partly meant that physics had got way more difficult with Einstein. And the, the difficulty of understanding what it really means, which I wouldn't claim to understand what this really means, that light bends, has to do with the difficulty of understanding the mathematics required to understand the theory of light and the theory of gravity that's now broadly accepted amongst physicists. So the fact that light can bend um, 
is a scientific fact in the most real sense of the term, but that fact is a theoretical construct. And the emergence of that fact is inseparable from the emergence of the scientific theory we, we know as general relativity, to just take that part of it. And its factual status today has to do with the acceptance of Einstein's theory as now a paradigmatic theory. No one rejects, in a sense, Einstein's theory because everyone's trying to, in a sense, make sense of how it combines again with quantum theory if you work at that fundamental problem in physics. So the, so the fact is a construct, and the construct is the result of highly advanced scientific theory. Now, this, this led enormous prestige to, to accrue more than it already had accrued to the character of the exact physical sciences. And if you never heard these terms again by exact physical science, we just mean sciences whose laws are mathematical. So a physicist is working with a field in which their core laws are not verbal descriptions of qualities, right? They're, they're, they are quantitative descriptions of, again, depends on what you think this means, but the quantitative descriptions of reality um, summarized in mathematical formulae. So the prestige of science led well before the 20th century, but after the developments in the 20th century when science got much more difficult and even more unintelligible to laymen and to uh, other scientists who weren't specialists in these areas, like in this case, we're talking about, you know, um, fundamental physics, theories of light, th theories of gravity, the emergence of the concept of the photon that comes out of all of this. Um, this leads you, and this is, of course, connected to Kuhn's example of physical optics. That's the light part, of course. This leads you to the idea that, and this is a fallacy, that anything that has the specialized apparatus of science, like journals and societies, that this means it's therefore scientific. Now, this has produced a lot of pseudoscientific ideas in the academy that unfortunately will sometimes use Kuhn as an excuse. And I'll give you an example. Um, only very recently, and, and this is a sociological fact that these people don't understand, basically in the past 50 to 60 years, um, in American academia in particular, but broadly speaking, Anglophone, so the academic communities that are most influenced by the elite universities of England and of America, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, Harvard, etc. These um, forms of philosophy um, ended up essentially adopting a shared metaphysical worldview, which is what they thought the scientific worldview was. And they um, developed the apparatus of scientific specialization of journals, which had already existed, but they developed the sociological features of, they would say, some of them of a paradigm. So, for example, I've literally heard, I won't cite the person because I don't want to, I'm not trying to make enemies or anything or attack anyone, but there's a contemporary analytic philosopher I could cite, and not the only one, who has literally said, um, well, analytic philosophy, this dominant school of um, philosophy today in the English-speaking world, analytic philosophy is a paradigm. And analytic philosophers think that what they're doing is science simply because it has the sociological apparatus of publishing journal articles and all of this stuff. Now, this is one of the, this is not a unique thing to analytic philosophy. I give the example because I'm a philosopher. I've published work in broadly the field, for example, of the, of the history of philosophy as it's done by analytic philosophers. For example, my Kant article, if you look at the footnotes, I'm primarily engaging people that today we would say are broadly speaking in analytic philosophy departments. This is just a matter of sociology. So the the idea that if you have scientific journals and you have technical jargon, that you're a science and you because then you think you have a paradigm, this is an abuse of Kuhn's idea of a paradigm. And I can show right away based on the first part of this lecture why that's the case. Remember, Kuhn says that a successful paradigm has at least two features that enable it to conduct normal science. One is it is sufficiently unprecedented in its novelty and successful 
grappling with existing problems of the field that it attracts many people away from the the theories that were contemporary contemporary with it. For example, there were many theories of light, or there were many ideas about light um, when Einstein and others um, inaugurated the quantum revolution. Um, but eventually, everyone more or less accepted the quantum revolution, and they accepted the strange you know, implications it had, or they accepted that they had to deal with the facts, the scientific facts that the theory had created about, you know, say, particle wave duality, then eventually the sort of things that are famously strange um, in quantum theory, uh, things like quantum entanglement and these sorts of things. Um, so this discovery of very advanced, very difficult to describe and very difficult to understand the meaning of scientific facts that were exactly described by certain mathematics that you could summarize in the key cases by mathematical formulae that were then rightly regarded as an R, as scientific laws. This led to an aping, an, a copying of the sociological structure of scientific specialization. And this copy of the sociological structure of scientific specialization, which is so obviously a fallacy, it's a fallacy called... Um, um, post hoc ergo propter hoc, which is just this Latin phrase that we still have, which is uh, after this, post hoc, after this, ergo, therefore, propter hoc, because of this. And that's, of course, a fallacy. Just because it rains after you burped does not mean that your burp, this is an idiotic example, but that's my intention because this is an idiotic fallacy that is so embarrassing that academics commit at such a large scale and it leads to such sad confusion just because you burped and then it rained right afterwards does not mean that it was raining because you burped. You can say, Sam, don't be an idiot. No one thinks that. Well, actually, people do think things as stupid as that today. They think because they've published in a scientific journal, meaning they published in a specialized journal, they think that they're doing science. Um, but the field of analytic philosophy has solved no problems whatsoever. None. In fact, the field of analytic philosophy doesn't know what the problems it think it's thought it was solving 50 years ago was because analytic philosophy is a style of doing philosophy in which the people doing it tend to only cite work from the past 10 to 20 years, basically the work of their mentors who they had to please and had to understand to get tenure in the academic system. And they don't tend to actually know or care about the history of even analytic philosophy. The history of analytic philosophy is completely unimportant to the practice of analytic philosophy. And the irony is analytic philosophers, just like other people who are subject to this fallacy in other fields, and I'm not going to pick on them because I'm professionally a philosopher. I'm not professionally, for example, a sociologist, but they do the same thing. Many people, for example, think that econ economics is a pseudoscientific field, and particularly people who actually are doing advanced work in the exact sciences. And the reason that they think that is because economics thinks they're a science. So economics thinks it's a science. Why? They think they're a science particularly because they've applied some fairly complicated mathematics since the 1970s to their field. And as a result, you have to be able to do that mathematics to do economics. And mathematics has this incredible prestige and, and it's difficult and it creates jargon. And so economists think that they're scientists. Are they scientists? Open question. Um, but they're not, they're nothing like physicists. They're nothing like physicists. So there's, and so there are now, because the prestige of the specialized apparatus of science, there are many areas of contemporary academia that if you're not an academic and you're not a specialist yourself, they look kind of like the natural sciences because they're jargon filled and they're difficult to understand and they have specialists but the specialists, the specialization isn't scientific. It's not solving any problems that their community agrees on. And you know this because a real paradigm solves outstanding problems. And that's why it draws, this is the first feature, remember? That's why it draws people away from existing theories. Analytic philosophy didn't draw people away from existing theories. It just excluded them from its own community and it stopped paying attention to them. It ignored them. So my work in philosophy, for example, is based on the problems this kind of thing poses because I think it's, 
it's a waste, uh, sadly, of very smart people who are otherwise smart, good people. But I think a lot of what they're doing is pseudoscientific because they think it's science and they don't even think about what that would mean. And that, by definition, is a big problem when you don't have any reason to think you're genuinely creating knowledge. And if you're interested in this, I lay out my theory of the skepticism that it should rightly generate about this kind of pseudoscientific practice in my article, a pretty early article I wrote called Why Listen to Philosophers? A Constructive Critique of uh, Disciplinary Philosophy. So this is the digression, and it leads you to understand, I hope a little better, what you will find is one of the main misuses of the Kuhnian idea of a paradigm. Is a paradigm is now used to mean any sociological consensus in a professional body of scholars or practitioners. And if people want to use it that way, it's fine. But I just think that should that should just be a shared theory. If you want to say it's a paradigm, that's fine too as a use. But it is it's important to know that use, while indebted to Kuhn, violates the key features of Kuhn's thing, of Kuhn's theory. And I think that violation leads to a lot of the problems people have with Kuhn is you've had certain people, particularly in the 1980s and 90s, in science studies, so-called, who took Kuhn's ideas in a way that he never supported and made it seem like, for example, sociology or history where science is in the exact same way or as equal to science um, as the exact sciences. In other words, they tried to say there's nothing special about the natural sciences. And I think this is a grave mistake. Um, even though I have made very clear, I don't think it's at all credible, even on historical or linguistic grounds, to say the only thing that science is the exact sciences or the natural sciences. But if you deny that there's something special about a science that's fully mathematicized, um, like physics or you know chemistry or something like that, if you deny there's something special about that, you're, you're I think, so factually inattentive to a fundamentally significant reality that you have lost credibility as a person speaking about the quality or nature of knowledge and how it develops. And many people used Kuhn, and they used Kuhn's idea of a paradigm to do exactly that. And as a result, they brought a lot of discredit um, to those who do seriously study science and who are, in a sense, scientists in their own fields, um, but they brought discredit to the serious people doing that. And so I wanted to bring this out and make it very clear because I think it's one of the main sources of legitimate skepticism towards what people think is Kuhn's work. Um, because there are people who have abused Kuhn's work routinely and they conflate the specialized apparatus of science and the sort of idiotic prestige that that now has. They confuse that with being actually scientific. And if you look at the scandals in science today, which are massive, I mean, look at the scandals at Harvard with the Harvard psychologist whose work was on honesty. And she's, you know, um, in trouble for having apparently fabricated her data on honesty. I mean, you literally couldn't make this stuff up. Hopefully someone makes a Hollywood movie about it. Um, and then she can make money even if even um, even if it ends up being true. But this story is is because people think, well, I published journal articles and I'm doing all this work. But in reality, you can ask, yeah, but is this really scientific work? And if the person's like, well, yes, because it's basically, it's like a paradigm, then you you kind of know that this person is unfortunately probably a pseudoscientist. So the paradigm, the concept of a paradigm is a very profound idea. It's about scientific specialization, but we have to remember it's about the achievement. That's a distinctive aspect of only some sciences and not others. Kuhn doesn't think you're not a science if you don't have a paradigm. But you have to understand paradigmatic science is a special form of science that he identifies with mature science. And when science becomes this mature, it can allow very productive advanced specialization. So we're going to go more into this and these ideas in the next episode uh, covering uh, the third section. So thank you very much for joining me. My name is Samuel Longcar. I'm the founder and creator of the Becoming Human Project and the editor of the Marginalia Review of Books. Please do like this video, uh, share it with your friends, uh, hit the bell, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And if you enjoy this kind of work and uh, believe in it, please consider supporting me on Patreon and joining the Becoming Human Project. And if you're interested in taking the seminar 
that I'll be teaching. There's only, I think, six spots open currently um, on this that I'll be running starting in the new year. Uh, just send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you.